Welcome to the program. I'm Aaron Dykes. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Today is Tuesday, April 24th, 2012. Tonight, breaking news from the InfoWar. The Bilderberg Group is set to meet in Virginia, May 31st to June 3rd. Is this Chantilly 3.0? Then, it looks like Ron Paul is winning states. In fact, he has the most delegates in Iowa and Minnesota, yet the mainstream media continues its ban on Ron Paul coverage. Plus, the Obama administration announces the war on terror is over. So why do we still have the TSA, NDAA, the Patriot Act, and countless wars of aggression? And we flash back to GM corn infected with AIDS. Is it coming to a cob near you? And finally, Aaron Dykes sits down with Yurian Masan. This will be a conversation with two of the most prolific writers exposing eugenics in the Northern Hemisphere. All this and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. I take you now to the InfoWars Central Texas Command Center, deep behind enemy lines, with Aaron Dykes, your host. Tonight in news, the location of the 2012 Bilderberg meeting may have been revealed. Uh, top researchers, including Tony Gosling, believe they've found that the location will again, for the third time, be Chantilly, Virginia, the site of Bilderberg in 2008, where Alex Jones and crew uh, helped surround the group and route them out. Indeed, protests against Bilderberg have been growing steadily since Alex first went to the Ottawa, Canada meeting in 2006 and the subsequent release of his powerful documentary, Endgame. Of course, Jim Tucker has been the longtime sleuth of Bilderberg, covering it more than 35 years, but that was many lonely years covering it out without the help of the mainstream press and the rest of it. Now, a large portion of international press have begun to cover the meeting. Even Fox News had to cover it last year in St. Moritz, where myself and Paul Joseph Watson went to cover the meeting in Switzerland. That meeting ended early because so many protesters gathered on the hill and chased them down during one of their nature walks. They decided to turn tail. We will, of course, keep you up to date on whether or not that is a confirmed location. They are a deceptive group. They control much of the world's agenda, and they may well change hotels or locations altogether. But that would be upcoming between the dates of May 31st and June 3rd, just over a month away. Meanwhile, Ron Paul, supposedly already out of the Republican race, supposedly Mitt Romney clinching the nomination. And yet, wait, hold on. Ron Paul actually won Iowa. And so the Iowa caucus leading off the GOP primary, the one that the establishment was so afraid Ron Paul might win, uh, that they said the Iowa caucus would be discredited and no longer count if Ron Paul won. Well, now he indeed has officially won, gaining officially a majority of those delegates. There's 28 delegates in Iowa. Ron Paul over the weekend gained at least 14. More will be chosen leading into the statewide and the national conventions. He's also has a majority of delegates in Minnesota and is likely to have a majority of delegates in as many as six or more other states, which would uh, contest things at the GOP delegation in August. Of course, we're not saying that Ron Paul is likely to actually get the nomination, but he's showing the fraud of the process. They definitely ripped him off. They gave him improper media coverage. They blacked him out of the media, did everything to tarnish his name, then did all kinds of election politicking, fraudulent vote counting. Who knows what happened with electronic machines? Why did he not gain votes versus 2008 numbers in uh in Nevada and on and on. Well, Ron Paul is just one front and the larger fight against the establishment. You have to engage the process to show that the process is not working while pursuing other peaceful alternatives to try to rein the system in to prevent it going to the full scale level. So that's something to watch. But they said Ron Paul couldn't win, wouldn't win. Now, in fact, he is winning. Let's go to the clip. Worst case scenario, Ron Paul ties for first place in Minnesota. Anything better than that, he wins outright. And it should be noted, he warned us this was going to happen. Thank you very much. When the dust settles, I think there's a very good chance that we're going to have the maximum number of delegates coming out of Minnesota. <laughs> Ron Paul was right. Nobody is getting more delegates than he did in Minnesota or in Iowa or in wherever else this Ron Paul delegate strategy of his pays off. 
And so even though people like Santorum have dropped out of the race, there still is a contest within the GOP. I think it's important that Ron Paul supporters continue to make their presence known. Of course, we've covered on this show how he continues to have crowds of 5,000, 10,000 or more at his rallies, while the Romneys of the world have only a few hundred and they have to cut the angles a certain way so they don't show that they have giant empty sports stadiums with only a few people down on the actual field. You've also got Ron Paul advisor Doug Weed commenting on the delegation process and of course the clip you just saw on Rachel Maddow, really the only mainstream outlet to cover it now that they've pretty much alleged that the process is over and that it's this Obama versus Romney thing and, and blah, blah, blah. It's all staged elections. I have no faith in that process, but I think we still do need to demonstrate the process. Uh, that's not double speak. I just think it's important to pursue both, not get your hopes up that you're going to fix the system through rigged elections, but at the same time, show that a strong candidate can have certain types of successes, show where he's been shut out of the ability to actually win, which he could have done if the media backed him, gave him a fair shot like the other controlled candidates, and if the elections themselves had been fair, if there wasn't all that fudging and whatnot, because you have to remember, First, it was Romney winning Iowa by eight votes, eight votes. Then a few weeks later, it was Santorum. All along, though, they had to know Ron Paul really had the delegate support, and now it's proven he has a minimum of a first-place win on the delegates for Iowa, Minnesota, and other states. Of course, Maine, one of the main states where he may have it. Meanwhile, the war on terror is over. That is, if you can believe an Obama administration official who's highlighted the fact that Obama can now safely embrace Islamists and that uh, activities like the Arab Spring and so forth have put a new path in the Middle East, a new way to gain popular support over there without having to fight the war against al-Qaeda. Of course, it has everything to do with the fact that through the Libyan war and now the effort in Syria to destabilize Assad, the West has openly partnered with Al-Qaeda, there's the headlines right there, the West and Al-Qaeda on the same side. Then in Syria, Al-Qaeda and the West back the Syrian rebels, and on and on. It's just a fact. Now they're covering for it as they make frontline the war against the American people. They're still going to keep all the police state, all the TSA checkpoints that they're now rolling out to bus stops, train stops, eventually highway checkpoints, eventually malls. They've already breached sports stadiums with big events like the Super Bowl. That will all continue to expand because America must be kept, must be dumbed down under the larger sustainable development plan for population control in every sense. But in many ways, the Obama administration has moved away from the fearful uh, exterior of the war on terror. Another aspect to it, though, the system may not be all intact on that point. They may not be giving up because just in the news, they're making big splashes over the supposed Al-Qaeda plot to bomb the Long Island Railway. Uh, they've got this trial with Bryant Neal Venice, uh, an American soldier uh, in the Army who later converted to Al-Qaeda in 2008. That's not a recipe for sheep dipping. Anyway, he supposedly wanted to bomb a Walmart and the Long, Long Island Railroad, and now there's big fear all over over the airwaves about that, even as certain Obama officials are saying basically the war on terror is over. Another war on the American people is in the executive power. Of course, the Constitution very succinctly lays out the balance of powers designed by the framers. The executive branch was to be co-equal with the judicial and congressional branches and checked in many other ways by the states and individuals of this country, but more and more uh, presidents are relying on executive power, and now Obama is officially in the headlines embracing that he, too, will have to use executive power because of the gridlock in Congress and the fact that so many dirty Republicans won't go along with his agenda. We can't wait, he says, and they've got all these quotes from board meetings. One Saturday last fall, President Obama interrupted a White House strategy meeting to raise an issue not on the agenda. He declared, aides recalled, that the administration needed to more aggressively use executive power to govern in the face of congressional obstructionism. Increasingly in recent months, he said, the administration has been seeking ways to act with Congress, branding its unilateral efforts, we can't wait. A slogan that aide said Obama coined at the strategy meeting and continued to roll out with dozens of new pro policies from jobs to veterans to drug shortages, fuel economy, and on and on. 
Obama's not saying he has a right to defy a congressional statute, said Richard Ace Pildes, a law professor at NYU. If the legislative path is blocked, he otherwise has the legal authority to issue an executive order on an issue. And they're more willing to do no that more than they were two years ago. And it goes on to talk about how Obama's new approach is doing just that, putting him in the company of his predecessors. Mr. Bush, for example, failed to persuade Congress to pass a bill allowing religiously affiliated groups to receive taxpayer grants, then issued an executive order to make the change. That's what presidents do, said one Mr. Jack L. Goldsmith. It's taken Obama two years to get there, but this has happened throughout history. You can't be in that office with its enormous responsibilities. When things don't happen, you get blamed for it. And not exercising all the powers you have accrued to it over time just doesn't make sense, they basically said. Well, that's what makes it more dangerous. Not that Obama's the first to rule by executive fiat, the first to misuse executive orders to put United Nations agendas on the table through strictly the executive branch or to try to pass an EPA ban on greenhouse gases strictly through the executive arm. It's been a gradual abuse of the executive branch. That's the real danger to our country. It's been ongoing really for a long time, but especially since the days of FDR. Recall he used the phrase broad executive power. Let's roll that clip now. I am prepared under my constitutional duty to recommend the measures that a stricken nation in the midst of a stricken world may require. But in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power. Broad executive power. I believe President Roosevelt has chosen the right path. We are dealing with the greatest social problems ever known, says Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist. Millions of unemployed must get their jobs back. And this cannot be left to private initiative. It is the government that must tackle this problem. So there you have it, broad executive power endorsed by none other than Nazi Joseph Goebbels back in the 30s when they were still gaining power into World War I and when he openly applauded the efforts of President Roosevelt to seize that executive power to do what must be done for the country. The only problem is it totally opened the gates to destroying the Constitution totally overusing the executive branch and on and on. You know, Harry Truman, uh, who succeeded FDR, used the phrase, the buck stops here, to describe the presidency at a time when it was increasingly untrue. More and more advisors and different departments and different administrations all under the executive branch began really running policy, both domestic and foreign, and increasingly presidents were nothing more than a puppet. They didn't decide hardly anything. And it's only gotten worse. The whole larger continuity of government program and on and on has largely mostly been done under the executive branch with a little uh, here and there from Congress. And you see that in one prominent example in the President's Council on Sustainable Development. That came in under Clinton in 1992. What is that? That's the United Nations Agenda 21 program implemented and signed under the elder George H.W. Bush, then transferred into executive action under President Clinton, and it's still being pursued today. We've discussed very recently all the Agenda 21 things being pursued under President Obama's branch. So it's executive orders, it's executive fiat, it's agencies, it's all of it. It's all been misused. And you know what's in the President's Council on Sustainable Development? What's in the overview? It's not only sustainable communities. It's not only equity and health and the environment and supposed economic prosperity. It's not only uh, education and international responsibility. It's population. It's population control for the first time ever on paper, a U.S. policy for the stabilization of the U.S. population. 
How did we get there? Let's go back to Henry Kissinger, 1974, National Security Memorandum 200, making for the first time ever the United Nations goal of stabilizing developing world populations, part of the United States foreign policy, to target developing world populations as a national security objective. What happened in between? You had people like John P. Holdren, now currently in the Obama White House, uh, telling us that we need to do this here at home. They said in Ecoscience, Holdren and Ehrlich did, the law regulates other highly personal matters. For example, no one may lawfully have more than one spouse at a time. See the reductive thinking? You have to agree to the first step, then the next. Why should the law not be able to prevent a person from having more than two children? This is 1977. It goes on from there. There's one more quote. Indeed, it has been concluded that compulsory population control laws, even including laws requiring compulsory abortion, could be sustained under the existing Constitution if the population crisis became sufficiently severe to endanger the society. So you see how they move us down the field, and now you've got the executive branch, just in one small example of the larger executive branch overreach, now dictating on paper U.S. population size. And you can see what some of their goals are. That's a whole another wormhole for another day, but it ties in to the larger cashless control grid that they are pursuing. And so now we've got the CISPA bill back on the agenda. Here we have security experts sending Congress a letter on the Fourth Amendment busting CISPA. Indeed, it's an open letter from dozens of cybersecurity experts, inventors of the internet, uh, IT professionals, and on and on, all saying don't do the CISPA bill and stop with these overreaching cybersecurity policies. You've also got Ron Paul saying the latest assault on Internet freedom is Big Brother writ large. But you've got people like Senator John McCain and others saying, yes, we specifically need to curb civil liberties and hand over all data for the purpose of cybersecurity. Again, part of the ongoing Bilderberg agenda to legitimize the mandate for cybersecurity to put all people of the world, especially in America, under the centralized database of larger command and control. With that said, we have TSA leaving a note to tell passenger, go to hell. Uh, what happened? New Yorker Ross Berenson found that TSA had dug into, broken and tampered with his luggage, despite having a TSA approved lock on his luggage. When he went to complain and get the form for that complaint, it had uh, carbon copied in on multiple copies, go to hell. Uh, in other words, whoever asked for a complaint form would have that stamped on there. Nobody could give me any answers about what happened in LA, but they very politely told me if I wanted to file a complaint, I could fill out a form, Berenson told the Gothamist. However, uh, when he filled out the form, it had the go to hell remark, just showing their attitude towards anyone complaining about their system, anyone speaking out, anyone not wanting to just submit and go along. But more submission is on the way as we've exposed. The Big Brother transport bill is set to advance in Congress this week. Paul Joseph Watson has the report. A Big Brother transit bill that would empower the IRS to revoke passports of alleged tax delinquents and mandate the installation of black boxes in all cars, as well as a myriad of other privacy-busting measures, is set to take a huge leap forward this week and goes into the details of this terrible bill called the Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century, MAP 21. Sounds very Agenda 21-esque. Uh, other papers, such as the Investor's Business Daily, have called it a Stalinist assault on mobility rights. And indeed, that's what all dictatorships do. They keep the population under control, keep them from being able to move about freely, criticize the government, leave the country, and they have ways to mark and punish dis dissidents, either financially or with the rights of government, turning them into privileges and keeping people contained. Uh, but that's not all. We've got more and more on the cash ban. You heard months ago about how Louisiana had decided to ban the use of cash for secondhand purchases such as pawn shops, garage sales, on and on. Well, that's happening in Europe as well 
as they deal with austerity and more under their larger economic problems, while the technocrats from Mario Monti in Italy uh, to those in Spain and the others have began to clamp down on using cash for large purchases. In one case in Spain, moving down to 2,500 euros at a time, uh, saying anything more is suspect and likely criminal in an attempt to avoid taxes. Other countries, such as in Spain, and I'm sorry, as in Italy, take that 2,500 euro mark and push it down towards 1,000 euros, saying anything more than 1,000 is now beginning to become a little bit suspicious. They have similar moves in the UK and other countries. So you can see the larger global government is beginning to move us more and more onto the cashless control grid, and cash itself is becoming more and must, more suspect and criminalized. That is a report from A.M. Freyed, another fine contributor to the InfoWars. Moving on, I wrote a short flashback article about other GMO problems we're seeing. We've covered the gamut on how GMO crops are causing organ failure, sterility, uh, other bizarre damage and deformities. Uh, a kind of a cloaked long-term third generation mast infertility among rats that have been tested and others in studies. Now, going back to 2002, we see another very dangerous aspect of the whole GMO movement. Flashback, escaped mutated GM maize on the loose, maybe carrying AIDS virus. Now, a lot of people misinterpreted this. I'm not saying you're literally going to contract AIDS from some piece of corn out there. What I'm trying to highlight is the fact that they're doing dangerous experimental test vaccines that they're growing in crops under this new pharmaceutical GMO crops thing that they've got going on and how that itself is tainting other crops. It's escaped. It's gone wild. And we don't really know what the effects are. Now, pull yourself back from this article. Look at the larger picture. We know autoimmune diseases are on the rise. AIDS or autoimmune uh, disorder syndrome is just one of those, of course, uh, as we know it to be basically the worst, but you've got Crohn's and a bunch of other varieties all on the uptick without any sign of slowing down. Where did it all come from? We know we have environmental, vaccine, food factors, and on and on, and this may be just worsening that problem. Now, going back to 2002, you've got a company called Prodigene, because they're prodigies and such geniuses, based in A&M University and College Station here in Texas, and they got approval from the USDA to conduct more than 85 open-air trials of their pharmaceutical drugs grown in GM maize varieties, and they decided to grow them right out in the open in the Midwest in places like Iowa and Nebraska where they were allowed to openly contaminate. And you've heard all the cases about farmers who want to grow organic, don't want the Monsanto seed, and yet they get sued because their crops are contaminated by 1% or less of Monsanto's GMO crops, and then they have to pay in court. Their whole agriculture is ruined. Well, this happened in a different context where their trials escaped, admittedly tainted crops, first in Nebraska, the U.S. state, USDA knew about it, but they covered it up, allowed Prodigene, the geniuses of GMO, to continue doing what they're doing. And then they had another contamination case where uh, one of their mystery viruses, which included the AIDS vaccine, a derivative for that, which included a blood clotting agent, which included a, a digestive enzyme that produces insulin, uh, industrial adhesives, and on and on, all these bizarre experimental vaccines, they're growing in GM corn, and it admittedly uh, was not cleaned up properly and later tainted a soya crop that was planted in the same space. It, it led to a criminal investigation, but the company was just slapped on the wrist with a quarter million dollar fine. Uh, the company wasn't stopped. They've, on, they've been continuing to grow to this day. Other companies like Monsanto or Dow Chemical continue to do their own experiments. But it's a lesson of how there could be open air contamination, uh, unexpected consequences to GMO, including and these very dangerous varieties. AIDS vaccine should raise a lot of questions, especially since many of these vaccines are known to contain the elements that cause the disease itself. Uh, weaker strains of them, so-called attenuated strains, are used to develop vaccines, yet they are part and participle to the actual disease. And this stuff 
has unknown contamination levels as worldwide diseases continue to climb, as the health of Americans and other Western nations c continues to decline, as globalists continue to tell us how they need to cull the population one way or another and how we had better go along with their plans. That's the real story here. I hope you can see it for yourself. It's not that you're going to catch AIDS from eating GMO corn. It's that they're contaminating the earth recklessly, wildlessly, as Alex has often warned about. Let's turn now to our daily quote. It comes from Ron Paul. It's about his legacy of sticking to his word. I will always vote what I have promised and always vote the Constitution. As well, I will not vote for one single penny that isn't paid for because debt is the monster. Debt is what's going to eat us up, and that is why our economy is on the brink. Ron Paul, not sure on the year of that, but he has indeed had a career-long, consistent message, and we wish him the best as he attempts to contend just the political spectrum of our ongoing operations in the U.S. as we try to restore the republic and rein in some kind of sensible government, something closely related to the Constitution, instead of the overtly Marxist world government aims they have. We'll be back after this with Yuri Masson, a key researcher into the world government and eugenics model. For this, thanks for watching. Stay tuned. Spread the word. InfoWars Nightly News. You ready? Thank you, Fred. Thank you. All right, let me gain myself. That threw me off slightly. I was almost ready. I'm Aaron Dykes. This is the InfoWars Nightly News, and we are back from break. We're joined now by a researcher who's become one of our main contributors as well, that is Yurian Masan, and he's here to discuss the Bilderberg Group, the larger population reduction agenda, and more. He joins us from the Netherlands. Thanks for joining us, Yurian. Thanks for having me. So we just broke the story today. It's up on InfoWars. Uh, sources so far are indicating the meeting will most likely be held in Chantilly, Virginia, here in the United States. It's been four years. They, of course, split their meetings between Europe and the United States. Uh, we'll follow up on that source to see if it is the true location because they do a lot of bait and switching and deception, but it is a very likely spot. So with that, let's talk about the upcoming Bilderberg Group meeting and what their agenda is likely to be. Their agenda uh, is likely to be uh, um, a continuation, I think, of the agenda uh, we already know. Uh, that's uh, population reduction, a large part of that. And uh, uh, to get this done, uh, the entire uh, economical political system has to be uh, arranged in such a way that it facilitates such a, a massive reduction. Absolutely. And of course, uh, they have demography groups that meet every year. They have United Nations Population Fund groups uh, that attend Bilderberg regularly. You've got the Rockefeller Foundation, who've really been the core driving the eugenics agenda over the past century. Now the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a major player in pursuing that uh, eugenics agenda. They don't attend every year, but they tend to attend every one to two to three years. Uh, so we're likely to see them there. A lot of the top tech giants come, as well as, of course, the heads of state and the uh, office, you know, the officials in various departments as well from both Europe and the United States. And that's definitely something they have planned. Of course, Agenda 21 is back on the agenda this year because it's the 20-year anniversary of the summit in Rio, which is all about sustainable development, uh, economic growth, uh, greening everything. But it also is in a large component about population reduction. And we've got one of our staff members, John, just showed me earlier today how the President's Council on Sustainable Development here in the United States set up for the Agenda 21 is not only pursuing sustainable development, but stabilizing the U.S. population. It's right here in writing, put into the agenda from Bill Clinton as well as the elder George Bush, and that's just here in the U.S. They're openly doing it all across the rest of the world, particularly in the developing areas. Right. Uh, they all seem to move in, in unison. Uh, uh, the, all the arms of the scientific dictatorship now, uh, you see it in every country, you see it almost simultaneously. That's not a coincidence, of course, that's uh, pre-planned. Um, uh, of course, the calls for deindustrialization of the, uh, of the developed world 
uh, is also a theme that regularly comes up, and it's all uh, being done under the uh, under perfectly uh, uh, decent euphemisms. Let's say uh, sustainability, uh, save the planet, and all that. Uh, we know from their own documents that's uh, just euphemisms for uh, a mass death. Yeah, and that's something to bring up, too. You've got the article yesterday. It's right here. Professor depicts blood depicting knife machine gun while talking population control. And this is a Professor John Gillibald from University College. He's an emeritus professor, and he's coined the term population matters. And the point he's trying to make is that, yes, these are euphemisms. He openly admits they use different terms as code for population control. And he's saying, just do away with the code. Let's come out in the open and tell people what we're doing. I've got another book here that goes along with that. It's the Rand Corporation's report on the origin and evolution of family planning programs in developing countries. And this is eugenics. They've changed the name dozens of times over the year. <clears throat> over the years. After World War II, it became population control. That became a buzzword that people learned to avoid, so they came up with these other terms, reproductive health, women's issues, uh, sustainable development, and on and on. They've literally coined these terms every couple of years at United Nations meetings. So uh, please get into that and the details of your article. Yes, this uh, Gillabout fellow, um, uh, he, he's actually quoted as saying while showing uh, a, a, a depiction of, uh, of a, a, a blood dripping knife and a machine gun. Um, um, he said, uh, uh, please don't say population control. That's what he literally said. Uh, say any other thing. Um, uh, use my phrase, population matters. So that's, that's a nice little tinkling. Um, uh, but never say population control. That's what he said. Then there was this uh, uh, gentleman over in the 20, 2006 gathering uh, um, uh, organized by the German uh, Development Bank. Uh, present were the United Nations Population Fund and all the other usual suspects, World Bank, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course, uh, where this professor of medical de uh, demography at the London School of Hygiene, John Cleland, uh, uh, indeed admitted that all modern day language um, uh, uh, used in relation to this, this agenda they, they uh, uh, seek to pursue is actually code. No more shrouding our statements in code, that's what he said. Uh, because code just confuses people. Uh, very interesting, uh, because it's all uh, euphemism and, 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 and here he actually admits to it. And you also point out it's what they call a thinly veiled threat. They say, quote, reduce human population numbers voluntarily or else. That's actually your summation of it. But it is this open threat, and it corresponds with images we've been shown, particularly in climate change propaganda, where you see the teacher pushing the red button and it blows up children who don't want to go along with uh, curbing their carbon footprint, and so on and so forth. We've seen dozens, if not hundreds, of these examples. And they're telling us covertly in the propaganda and the media, they want to kill us, that our life is invaluable, that they want to save the earth by reigning in the population numbers. But they also tell us, go along with our agenda and everything will be all right. Right, trying to scare us into, into this submission or submissive state uh, where we will just accept about anything. Um, uh, and that, that, that's the entire thing. Uh, they resort to these kind of tactics and that means they have a weakness. And this weakness uh, uh, by the elite is they, um, uh, they know that a lot of uh, uh, people, despite all the propaganda for the last decades, still have an instinctive uh, resistance to all this, this uh, uh, massive uh, uh, propaganda uh, going on. So I think uh, uh, this is also a good sign, in, in a way, uh, that they just uh, 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 use open death threats uh, towards mankind. Uh, uh, that's because they know uh, we only by death uh, threats they uh, may have a chance. And if you've studied this stuff in depth, as you and I have and many others in our audience have, how could you go along with it knowing that they brag about spiking the vaccines, brag about putting poisons in the foods and developing GMO strains that are at the very least dangerous? We covered earlier today how uh, several years ago, back in 2002, they were open air experimenting with experimental vaccines, strains of what was to become an AIDS virus, blood clotting agents, on and on, all kinds of very potentially dangerous stuff that they were growing in America's Midwest Corn Belt, where they grow the food for our country and much of the rest of the world. And the, the possibilities for open air contamination are right there. And it's just another suggestion of how 
where this road could lead, really. Right. I think, and then we all have the the, the, the UN to thank for this um, uh, agenda going on right now, uh, because uh, it's the, of course Codex Alimentarius uh, um, in action. Um, we see that in the crops. Uh, we see it in in the vaccines uh, with the help of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, especially in the third world, uh, which the eugenicists uh, and the elite right now uh, want to begin uh, by depopulating uh, for a large part, uh, because they know that the West. Uh, is a little bit more um, challenging for them. Uh, so, um, uh, indeed, we see, uh, uh, well, all these arms moving um, uh, in the same direction, um, uh, attempting to, uh, I think, reduce our fertility in, in, in first instance. But, uh, uh, well, it's actually, of course, for death. I want to go back to the Bilderberg Group and the larger eugenics agenda. Of course, eugenics, the proper term for it, started in the late 1800s under the circles around T.H. Huxley, uh, of course, Sir Francis Galton, and his cousin Darwin. And they brought that to light. It became very popular in the West, especially in the United States. It's very popular in Germany, uh, which later developed into Nazi Germany eugenics. It was very popular in the Netherlands and the rest of Europe, and really across the Western world. As that developed, you also see simultaneously the cartel, IG Farben, out of the Nazi regime and their secret partnership with the United States, with the Netherlands in particular. How did those factions come to form what we know as the Bilderberg Group? What's the role of people like Prince Bernhard, admittedly one of the founders of Bilderberg, as well as environmental groups, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, and the other clubs you've mentioned, the 1001 Club, and so forth and so on? Uh, I think that the, the Second World War, which was uh, uh, in essence, uh, of course, um, uh, brought into being uh, uh, with the aim of creating two separate blocks, uh, which is uh, uh, the United States on the one hand, uh, the West on the one hand, and the East on the other, is also uh, is of course the illusion of uh, of, of of a war or a battle, uh, in which they can sustain their policies. Uh, you need uh, fear to uh, sustain these policies of, 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 of mass uh, population reduction. Um, and you need to do it incrementally. And I think the uh, uh, Prince Bernhard uh, of the Netherlands uh, uh, setting up this Bilderberg uh, meeting uh, officially to um, repair our, our uh, relations with the United States uh, and Europe, but actually to uh, form a group that could um, uh, make policy in full impunity. Um, uh, pursuing their agenda. Um, and of course, it's, again, it's the Sex Cobra Gotha family uh, involved in this. So you see, um, uh, involved in, uh, in all these meetings are uh, people of the European royal uh, elite. Uh, those are the people with uh, enormous amounts of resources, land also. People forget about that sometimes, but uh, they have uh, such an enormous amount of land uh, that they um, actually uh, wanted to call the shots uh, inside uh, a uh, unofficial group. I think that's the Bilderberg group. Um, um, the, the real reason behind it is, is uh, population control. And what do you find in your research with the phony environmental movements, particularly World Wildlife Group, among others? Well, you have that, uh, what was it, Earth Hour? Uh, Earth Hour was this, uh, this sign that uh, everybody should, uh, you know, uh, put out the lights, dim the lights for the Earth. Uh, and the World uh, Wildlife Fund, the same here. It, it was also uh, founded by uh, Bernhard on the one hand and Julian Huxley on the other. He was co-founder of the World Wildlife, Wildlife Fund. Again, back uh, to the heart of eugenics. Yeah, go ahead. Right. He is the, he, I mean, he is the eugenicist of the 20th century, uh, and he, is, he, of course, himself was uh, was an heir to um, uh, uh, the older eugenicist, you know, Galton type characters. Uh, so uh, you see this genealogy of of of, of uh, sociopaths uh, uh, running things, uh, having the resources for it, and they set up this World Wildlife Fund um, uh, to uh, really um, invade. Uh, uh, the continent of Africa in, in first instance uh, um, under the pretext of wanting to sell, uh, save wildlife, wanting to save the earth, wanting to help the people there. Uh, but actually what they did was uh, um, uh, capture the resources of the continent. Uh, I just recently wrote an article about that. Uh, so um, it's, it's very sickening. Yeah, just to dovetail, of course, one of the other founders 
Prince Philip of uh, Saxe Coburg Gotha, who said he wants to come back to Earth as a virus to lower human population level, another World Wildlife Fund initiator. And as you mentioned, it's land grabbing and it's population reduction in combination, which, which goes along perfectly with the Agenda 21 for sustainable development, coined, of course, 20 years ago under the United Nations and still being pursued very actively today. And all this continues because under the president, presidency of Obama, you've got John P. Holdren, who is himself a successor to decades and decades of covert eugenics, covert population reduction, and this larger land grab under the United Nations. Julian Huxley, who you mentioned, not only is a eugenicist, uh, third generation eugenicist at that, and part of a larger uh, family breeding program, but he wanted to specifically fuse in a kind of alchemical way the West with the particularly Soviet-led East into the world government. That's his theory in his 1946 document, UNESCO, Its Purpose and Philosophy. He really talks about fusing those systems together, developing the education and the culture and the science under his umbrella at UNESCO. Right, uh, and using the state, uh, the state as the engine to uh, to um, uh, make sure these policies will be executed. So that's why the Soviet system was perfectly uh, worked perfectly fine, just like China does right now, uh, because it works on a collectivistic uh, basis, and people are used to that over there. Uh, and now they have to get used to uh, all these new uh, environmental friendly uh, policies, these these this virtuous green road. Uh, which was described by uh, uh, a UN thinker uh, in the early 90s, uh, calling it a virtuous green road, while all the documents uh, uh, are definitely pointing to one agenda, uh, which, which has an aim of, of, of reducing population, reducing fertility, and to do it incrementally. So it's a very smart and sophisticated thing, uh, which we have to uh, constantly, constantly investigate. Incremental is the key word. Uh, let's get into a little bit the Fabian Socialists, because that's the group that includes both Huxley brothers, Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World, Julian Huxley of UNESCO, George Orwell was once in that group, H.G. Wells was in that group, and a lot of other very famous, very prominent writers who all wanted this progressive, long-term, 100-year increment for socialism. That's apparently why George Orwell named his novel 1984. It was the 100-year anniversary of the 1884 founding of the Fabian Socialists. And many people don't know, they went from their core place in Britain over to Soviet Russia, studied their system, uh, applauded what they were doing, and they came back, according to the founder of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Alfred Toynbee, and said, this is our new Ten Commandments. This is what Moses came down from the mountain with from God. We have the ten planks of communism. We want this, but we want it slowly, so no one will stop it. No one will notice what's going on. And, and that's what you see in a larger pattern under the United Nations, a form of acclimating the whole world to a world government system. Right, and 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 it's and it's actually more than just communism in the in the or socialism in the Marxist sense. Uh, 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 that's just a theory. But the UN is is above uh, these 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 differences of of communism and and capitalism, creating them in fact. Uh, uh, so the, the, there's nothing to do with class warfare. This Fabian socialist society. It has everything to do with elitism. Uh, uh, because there's deciding. the wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, you're totally right. Go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, I, I couldn't agree more. Well, we've got a lot of the same research. That's why it's easy to agree. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's fine. That's fine because, uh, I mean, that's, that's all about to say. It's wolves in sheep clothing. That's it. And they have this agenda uh, uh, for such a long time. That is, it's, and it's all written down uh, that, that right now we have to move forward, I think, to, to a next level of just, just – uh, beating these people at every turn. Every time they put out a new report, put out a new, uh, 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 you know, a working paper or something. We just have to report on this constantly. Everybody should do this. Everybody uh, who, who feels uh, impulse to do this, do this. Start your own blog and just uh, write about this because uh, we need so much more people involved in this, in this fight. Well, in closing, looking ahead to the upcoming Bilderberg Conference, if the location's wrong, we're going to correct that, of course. But uh, whether it's in the U.S. or Europe, we have seen this year a great coalescing around the, glo uh, the global
global warming climate change agenda, realizing that's falling apart on its scientific merits and, and its political drive and so forth, they've been more and more out in the open moving towards just it's for population reduction. It, have you seen this as well? Yes, uh, uh, just lately, I think the last year or so, uh, uh, they, they, they started over from, uh, from uh, you know, personal carbon quotas and all that, uh, just to saying uh, we need, um, uh, you know, just global carbon cops and all that. Uh, this was this, uh, this uh, Earth Summit 2012 promoters calling for global implementation of personal carbon quotas, but they also called, and that's very um, uh, disturbing, uh, um, uh, securing commitments from governments to try to stabilize global population. That's the quote. Um, stabilize the global population. Um, uh, also, uh, they want an international court for the environment uh, to settle disputes. Mm -hmm. uh, which means uh, you can go to jail because uh, your carbon footprint is a little bit too big. Uh, this echoes the, uh, the, the death threat made uh, uh, by the use of this commercial with children. Children. Um, um, so this is, this is just off the chart madness. Well, I think you hit it on the nail, the nail on the head. It's elitist coming out from their hiding in sheep's clothing and saying, we're going to kill you if you don't go along with our agenda. So you better go along with it. Uh, just kidding. We're sheep. We're not really wolves. And we're doing this for everyone's good. And it's to save the earth. But if you don't go along with it, you're next. Well, anyway, right. uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's, it's, it's a very dark energy we see, uh, we feel uh, from these people emanating from them. Uh, so it's, 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 uh, uh, we all have to uh, uh, step up a little bit, I think, uh, uh, everybody uh, looking just to, f to fight these people. Well, we appreciate you joining us, Urian. Uh, of course, we'll look to your research in the future. Your articles are at Infowars.com, and are they on one of your blogs as well? Uh, I don't even have a blog yet, <laughs> but I, I do, do write a lot, so, uh, but I have, still have to build a blog. I'm uh, in the process of doing that right now. Okay, well, we'll uh, look forward to your reports in the future. Thanks again for joining us. That's it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. We'll be back again tomorrow with Darren McBreen. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching Spread the Word. Don't forget to subscribe at PrisonPlanet.tv. Help us fund our fight against the controlled media, against the globalists, and against their larger agenda.